which is the Elm Tree of Mastery. We'll start with a video from Carol Dweck. Um, she's one of our awesome National Advisory Board members and does research at Stanford University and has been at the best, Columbia, Harvard, uh, so I trust her. But uh, <laughs> I, I think what you'll see in this video are some things that you might think are obvious and some things that might be new. So really pay attention to what stands out for you. And after the video, we'll talk about what uh, you learned and what stuck out. Cool. All right, we'll just pretend we played it. Play the video. Okay, what, what did you hear her say? What stuck out for you in that video? Um, I think first of all, what hit me is when she said, most coaches think it's obvious that yeah. players you know, know that they value effort. And I started thinking, well, of course my players know that. And then I thought, well, if she pulls my players aside and asks them, <laughs> they might not say that. So yeah. I thought that was an aha moment for me. Absolutely. I think that um, most people think that you're going to value it. Most people think that all students or all, co all players have been taught that before, but you might be inheriting a player who really didn't have that in their last program or on their last team. So really making sure that you tell them and that they know that it's important to you is really important. So that stuck out to me as well. And I think that is uh, very helpful. So i um, sorry. I'm on the um, so how do you do it? How do you get athletes to believe that they can get better? Well, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but coaching lacrosse, I love coaching lacrosse. I coached field hockey, basketball, lacrosse, and track, and I love lacrosse because not everybody can do it. True. So there's really quick wins along the way when one day a girl couldn't even catch a ball, the next day she's catching yeah. and throwing, or, you know, it's not something you can just kick a ball. So I love the sport of lacrosse because it's, it's new, and I coach the younger guys. So this is literally the first time they've ever picked up a ball with a stick and been able to actually get it where they want it to go. So I spent a ton of time just showing them improvements, improvements, improvements all the time. Great. That's an awesome example. Um, I just said it before, but the first thing really is you have to tell them. You have to tell them they're going to get better and that you value it, that the harder they work, the better it'll come and that it's really important to you. Um, so that's a big piece of it is just making sure they know, which we saw in the video, uh, noticing it. You know, even if there's that player who isn't quite catching the ball right away, <laughs> noticing that they're really pulling their hand back or that they're keeping their eye on the ball, whatever it is that you're seeing them do better, notice it and give them that praise for it. And then when it happens, when you get the win or when you get the goal, uh, make sure you tell them why, that it was because they worked so hard to get there, not just because they were talented or because they got lucky, um, but really make sure they know it was because of all that hard work they put in. Um, I think sometimes we, we have to learn how to say that. Uh, so if you would for me, can you read what it says on the slide here in yellow? Sure. That was a great play. You've really been working hard in practice and it shows. Yeah. Um, and hopefully your player really hears that and resonates with that player, but also everyone else hears it um, so that they can realize, oh, you're right. You know, maybe she is taking some time to get better, but that player is going to get there and it was important and you valued it. So as a coach, those are kind of three ways that you can really show that it's important um, to get better. Uh, when we talk about the elm tree, which we'll dive into a little more, is that we're really focusing on getting peak performance out of your athletes, right? And again, we want that to then become winning. You know, you want to be able to win, but it's going to maybe take a while. Your peak performance at the best might not win a game. Um, we're about to head into March Madness. We've got games tonight. And some of these teams are absolutely playing the best basketball of their lives. They've just won their conference tournament. Uh, but then they're going to go play Virginia. <laughs> and yeah. we'll see how they do. You know, and I love the upsets. And we know that we're going to get many in the next several days uh, and weeks. So it's my favorite time of year. But for sure, um, just making sure that the best effort and peak performance is what we're getting out of players is going to be really um, exciting out of your teams. So there's a couple ways you can define winning. Um, and we'll focus on these two here is that um, there's a scoreboard definition. Uh, who won the game, right? We ask every, if we see a little league team out to ice cream after a game, what's the first thing you ask them? Did you win? Did you win? Right. We didn't say, did you have fun? Did you, you know, we ask him if they won. So that's a scoreboard definition. And that really is sort of where our society uh, is at most of the time. On the other side, there's the mastery definition. And there's been a lot of research that shows that coaches who teach this kind of the mastery concept uh, are the ones who are going to win. So what we mean by that um, on the scoreboard, we want to see the results. We want to see who on the scoreboard had the better, uh, more goals, more baskets. Uh, versus uh, mastery, it's effort. 
who put forth that maximum effort? Um, how do you maybe redefine what success is on your own team so that effort is a key part of that success? Uh, Scoreboard, we're comparing ourselves with others. Um, are you better than? Were you faster than uh, the person you competed against? Or um, versus on the mastery side, are you learning? Are you growing? Uh, my daughter just got a scooter about 10 days ago, got her first Razor scooter. She's five. And uh, she raced her best friend on the playground. I didn't even know what was happening. I was busy chatting. She came over in tears. She came over in tears because she had lost the race. Um, and that's, you know, that's a hard concept to teach. And I feel like um, I mentioned, you know, the tantrums were undefeated, her soccer mm -hmm. team. So I really realized this was a hard concept for her. Uh, and at first she, she blamed her friend's helmet. It was more aerodynamic than hers. <laughs> so I had to reframe. I said, you know, Mary, um, you just got your scooter one week ago. And Emmett's been on his scooter since Christmas, right? So you're already getting so much better, but you've only had it for one week. So how do we really make sure you keep getting better and you keep practicing? Um, and I offered, should, let's time you. Let's time you the next time and the next week we'll time you again. So, you know, really being able to compare yourself to yourself versus compare yourself to the guy who said his green razor scooter since Christmas um, <laughs> can be helpful. Uh, and the other thing is mistakes. Um, if, if you're looking at the scoreboard definition, mistakes are not okay. That's what your students are, are your players are, are nervous about, you know, um, whereas in mastery mistakes are, are not just okay, but we need to make mistakes in order to get better. Um, what's the one thing that really scares a player the most about getting out there? Making a mistake and getting pulled out of the game. Absolutely. Getting pulled out of the game, uh, being embarrassed by making that mistake, um, doing something wrong, fear of... Their, their team mad at them. Yeah. Being punished. You know, my whole team's going to have to run if I make this uh, mistake that I was told not to make. That playing with fear is is one of um, the most challenging things for our, our coaches, for you as a coach, to, to try to reduce that fear. Um, we want our students' anxiety to go down. And in a mastery climate where we're trying to make our students better with effort and learning and the mistakes are okay, their anxiety is going to go down. Uh, and your self-confidence is going to go up. You know, there's a lot of research that shows that if you have two sort of equal talented players, the person who has more self-confidence is going to be the one who likely um, has better result. So um, if our goals are to reduce that anxiety and have better self-confidence, then focusing on that mastery effort is so, so important. Um, also, it gives our players a sense of control. Uh, I'd like to just tell a quick story. I worked at Seattle University for years and years and years, and, and I mostly only or upcoming test or whatever, but inevitably, we also talk sports, and one of my former players you know, came in, and we were talking about an essay, and then she says, oh, I can I hang out here a little longer because I got a meeting with coach? She looked a little nervous. I said, oh, what's going on? So we're going to talk about next year. And uh, I said, well, what are you worried about? She's like, I don't know. I haven't been shooting well. I haven't been playing so much. I'm just not sure what she's going to say. So I gave her a little pep talk and said, oh, you know, good luck. You'll be all right. Um, and let me know how it goes. Well, she comes back about 30 minutes later. She says, oh, I feel so much better. I said, well, what, what happened? She said, she just said I wasn't fighting hard enough. I wasn't, I couldn't, she couldn't see how hungry I was. And she wasn't sure that I wanted it, that she didn't see my effort. And she looked relieved. I, I would have been, I was like, oh, that's kind of upsetting. But <laughs> she looked relieved and she was relieved because she could control it. She was, I can do that. I can show her that. And I was so impressed by this student. Uh, and I just, uh, to tell you, she's going to be playing an NCAA tournament on Friday. Her team is mm -hmm. making history. They are going to play Oregon. So I'm really pumped for her and her team. And I think it shows so much how the coach really um, promotes that effort is important and also how the student embraced that. I can do this. Uh, you might not be able to, to make 100% uh, of your free throws, but you can show that you're really hungry and ready uh, to get better. Let's take a scenario. I wanna hear more from you. Um, let's say your team plays tentatively and lets the opponent really drive the action. I think this happens a lot, especially when you get to a game, you're intimidated by maybe the size or the record of that team. What can you do to really um, help your students in that situation? I think um, I remember I coached basketball and we were up against um, one of the toughest teams in the league for our very first game. And mm -hmm. 
I remember that the girls, like, even in the locker room, when they saw the other girls out there warming up, they had this real fancy warm up and they were huge and they got really, really worried. And so the first quarter of the game, even after my big pep talk, they were really nervous and they were just literally letting the team walk all over them. And I came out and I brought them in and I just asked them, like, what are you afraid of? And, and they said, well, we're afraid of losing. And I said, Hey guys, you know what? You're playing not to lose. You're not playing to win. And I said, let's go out there and play our game and not worry about them. I said, as long as we have possession of the ball, they're not going to touch it. They're going to be fine. So let's just work on possession. And it was basketball. So I wasn't focusing them on shooting and Mm -hmm. they went out and we lost, but they went out and they, they at least played harder. And I think the fear just right off the top of their mind in the very two seconds of the game was we're going to lose. And part of me felt like saying, okay, you are going to lose. Now go play your butts off. (laughs) Mm -hmm. say that but you know looking back I was like I wonder if that would have worked if I would have just said you are going to get your butts kicked so you might as well work hard (laughs) yeah it's hard because you don't ever want to set someone up to think they're going to fail but it's to make sure that they know there's nothing to lose if they play with everything they've got. Uh, I think that it's, it's awesome when, when players learn that they can play better than they've ever played when they play better talent. Um, mm-hmm. Also, on the other end, there's going to be sometimes when it's going to be a blowout in the other way. You, know, you might be the absolute best team out there uh, at a tournament, let's say. But how do you still make sure your team is focusing on effort so they're getting better? And not just winning because it's easy to win when the talent um, that maybe you're playing against isn't quite there yet. Uh, so, you know, I think right now in youth soccer, especially out in Seattle, but I think nationwide, they've changed a lot of the dynamics of what teams players are on. And all of a sudden the best teams only get to compete against the other best teams at national tournaments or at really regional tournaments. So in just the city area, you might you just might not have a good disbursement of talent on different teams. And there might be a little um, bit of blowouts here and there. I know we see that in our lacrosse league all the time. There's only a couple teams. Uh, The team that's called Seattle women's, they get more Google searches. So they often get the best newcomers (laughs) to the area. And my team breakaway often gets the folks we got to try to recruit a little bit harder. And so um, I know we love playing them, but some years that the talent is a little bit off and we have to work really hard at making sure that it's still a fun environment to be in and that we're all giving it our all. Um, Let's talk about some takeaways. I think it's easy to say, yeah, we want to promote effort as much as possible, but let's, let's pull out the book again. Um, again, I've, I've mentioned this before, but this is a resource for you in the long haul, uh, as well as the emails that you'll get. But really, I want you to know that this is it's a quick read, but you can use this different ways. So if you would pull out the book and go to page 27. Uh, number five is maximize effort by rewarding unsuccessful effort. Uh, so if you would, Kelly, would you just read for me that first sentence? Yep. I'm grab my book. Oops, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to walk away. I was starting to think, is my book on the shelf over there? Okay. So I'm reading what? Uh, so go down to number five on 27, page 27. Yeah. The first sentence there under maximize effort. Okay. All coaches reward players who make the play. It sounds crazy, but to maximize team effort, reward players who try hard but fail to make the play. Yeah. Um, so making sure that you're really recognizing that publicly and one-on-one with, with that with that player is really important. Um, what do we do when our students make mistakes, which they're inevitably going to do? You know, um, uh, let's say they, may, they they missed a big shot or they they um, let a defender, they, they're playing defense and they just let somebody cut behind them. They didn't mark a man, whatever. What are some things that we can do to help them get over that? I think just, just focus them on the next play that's happening and, and yeah. not dwell. Um, yeah. The only time that came back to bite me was I just went to my daughter's district swimming championship and it was the final championship and one of her teammates false started and oh. she goes, all right, PCA person. Now what? Cause she was done. It was her last race of the whole season. And she false started. I was like, she goes, there is no next play. And I was oh. like, oh, <laughs> First, that, that is really, that is really tough. I didn't even know what to say. I was stumped. I was like, oh no, you're right. I know that. Yeah. That's, that's one that you may get stumped on for <laughs> sure. Um, I, I loved your answer, but in the heat of the moment, we've got to make sure people maybe practice it. And so I love this next concept that comes um, and we'll hear it from Curtis Granderson, but I, I heard this a lot, especially in baseball. I, I think, <laughs> I think um, baseball coaches know that they want 
players, especially pitchers who have short-term memory loss, right? <laughs> because you're not going to throw a strike every single time. Uh, our baseball coach at Seattle, you used to call one of his pitchers Dory from Finding Nemo, <laughs> right? <laughs> couldn't remember anything. <laughs> um, and it was really helpful to, to that player because, you know, you, you throw a bad pitch and you got to get a, another one. Um, Curtis Granderson is, is awesome. And I think, uh, especially being from New York, everybody loves him because he played for the Mets and the Yankees. And now he's with the Toronto Blue Jays. But I, I love this um, idea of a flush it mistake ritual. Um, and so why don't we hear from Curtis Granderson now? All right. Play the video. Great. Go, Curtis. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I love the idea of a toilet bowl. Does anyone else have any other mistake rituals that they have used in the past that maybe isn't so physical? <laughs> yeah, we do shake it off on my team. Oh, right, yep. Like the beginning of the season, we just do like the Taylor Swift shake it off and we all dance around. And so the girls just said they like shake it off. So now on the side of the field, we just feel like if they make a mistake, they just kind of shake their hand and shake it off. Awesome. That's, that's a really good one. Um, I've heard people just kind of tapping themselves. I got it done. It's over. Um, wiping the brow, whatever it might be just to, to get it behind you. Um, and like I, I mentioned before, it's, it's just something you might want to practice as a team and, or it may be something that the whole team embraces like the toilet bowl, or it may be something that each person sort of has their own that they can connect with right away. You've got one person shaking it off. You got another person sort of wiping their shoulder and another person flushing it. And I think that works just as well. Uh, and from there, we'll move on to the third concept, which is rips honoring the All game. Right. Okay. That was quick. Yes. Well, yeah, that was great. <laughs> that was a little faster than I thought, but I think I was going planning on introducing myself. So, yeah. Well, that's okay. You'll have time too when you do it for real. There's going to be, you know, more questions, more, you know, yeah. interaction. Yes. More than one answer from. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was. That was. What time did you? Yeah. One twenty-one. That was. That was, that was quick. It was like fifteen okay. minutes, I think. Yeah, but it's it's. But I think it's better to practice it quickly so that because when you're in a room with people, you will get the storytellers. You will get you know, and also if you have some more time at the end. Um, you know, that's when I say, okay, any questions about mastery or what struggles do you have with this? A lot of times rather than saying, do you have any questions? Because people don't usually answer when you say, yeah. that. but if you say, okay, what challenges do you think this is going to bring for you? What, are, what part are you struggling yeah. with? What part do you think you'll use? Something like that gives you more time. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, this is, this is personally one of my favorites and we do a whole workshop on mastery now, which I just mm -hmm. did last week. And I, I absolutely love it because I think there's so much here that are um, physical things that coaches can do. And it's so simple. And yeah. it's just, and you even use the word reframing. It's just reframing the way you coach. It's the way you look at things. It's the way mm -hmm. you make athletes look at things. And it's about yeah. performance. And so, yeah. you know, after Philly emotional tense, um, a lot of times coaches think like that's all the feel good, fluffy. They know yeah. the kids are going to perform better. But then you get into this one, and like the meat and potatoes, like this is what yeah. we're going to do. This actually for years was our first principle. And we actually just swapped it out um, in 2016 to be the second principal because if the players are not getting their tanks filled and it's not a good positive culture, it doesn't matter how much mastery you're focusing on. It's not going to work. Yep. So that's kind of a good transition. Um, this workshop doesn't talk too much about it, but we've studied a lot with Dr. Barbara Fredrickson under Caring Climate. And okay. even the best coaches that are focusing on mastery, if they don't have a, a caring climate on their team and the players don't know they care about them, then the players will think, oh, my coach just wants to win. And that's why they're pushing me to work, you know, max effort, max yeah. effort, max Because there's a lot of great coaches or great, great records with horrible coaches. And the coach says, max effort. That's what I want. Yeah. So, but I thought that was great. How did you feel going through that? Did you feel rushed or did you feel like you were, you know, good? I felt okay. Um, I feel like I still need to work on when it comes to talking about sort of sports psychology and, being able to kind of beef up what I want to say about mastery, mm -hmm. the words aren't rolling off my tongue as well as I yeah. would like. So I, I need to, I don't know, kind of practice that a little more on how mm -hmm. I want to say it so yeah. that it does roll off the tongue better. I felt like I was a little, um, compared to the intro, I got stumped a little bit yeah. in my own head. That'll come too. That'll come too. One of the things that I used to do in like when I first started doing this, every once in a while, I would just go back and read the chapter in the book. Yeah. Like it really is worded well there. Oh, yeah. and I would, like think, oh, how do I say that? How do I do that? And I would read the chapter. I'm like, oh, Jim Thompson said it pretty well. And it would just help with language and yeah. 
you know, questioning things like that. I thought one of the first things I said, uh, I wrote down was smooth. I think you're very smooth. And I like the way that you're not waiting for the slides to go on to the next topic. Um, I think that's a huge skill because we want these, we want these workshops to have moments where coaches go, aha, that's right. Yeah. I need and if you're just focusing on slides, you can't do that. So I think that's a really, that's a really strong point that you have um, great transition and the expression and the energy that you have just naturally, it's not forced. Um, that's going to keep everybody, you know, on, on, in, on, on task. I want to say, I don't know if that's the right word, but on point as to yeah. what you're doing. Um, I would say when you go through the, let me see where I am. When you go through this video um, of Carol Dweck and you talk about this, this is a great place for just to stop for a minute and yeah. ask the coaches, how, how do you do with this? Like, think of something yeah. like the things, you know, obviously this is how you're going to get better. Tell them, become a noticer of effort, attribute success to effort. That was a great play. You've really been working hard in practice and it shows. This is what we know research has shown will help kids improve better. What yeah. do we usually do? Like, what do we usually do as coaches instead of that? Gotcha. And, and the answers that you'll get from people are, we usually say, good shot. That was really fast. Mm -hmm. You're an awesome, you know, you're an awesome sprinter. Um, yeah. And that's where I kind of, and even though it's not in this workshop, it is mentioned in the book, but that's where I throw in, you know, one of the things that we get from Carol Dweck is this idea of, are you coaching with a mastery focus in mind? Are you coaching to give these kids a growth mindset? Or are you coaching to give them a fixed mindset? And, you know, again, it's not in here yeah. um, in other workshops that we do, but I like to just throw it out there because a lot of people are familiar with fixed and growth mindset yeah. just from the world. Yeah. So I kind of put it in there to get a little bit of credibility, but also to say as coaches, what we're doing by only rewarding, wow, good shot. And I did it too. And I always admit, you know, I'm the first one as a coach yeah. and as a parent, you know, I told my oldest daughter, you're so fast. You're the best artist. You're great. You know, I told her all these things. There were all these fixed traits. And then again, like your daughter, she came up against a challenge and was like, oh, I'm terrible, you know, because I spent the first four years of her life telling her how great she was. Yeah. I wasn't focusing on her effort. I was focusing on, wow, you're fast, you're smart, you're funny, you're, you know, all this stuff that I thought was giving her confidence. So yes. that was, that's just the one suggestion if you want to throw that in there, if you want to beef yep. up and sound like you have more research than, you know, the yeah. workshop. Um, the other thing that, and this an idea for you that I've been doing. I don't know if you heard me say this before. When you get to this slide here, um, I've only been doing this probably for about the last six months. I saw a trainer do it and I stole it and I love it. Okay. Um, so did you hear me talk about how I, I have them do a 30 second halftime speech? I don't remember. Heard... I don't know. Okay, so, so what I do is I do similar to you. I explain the difference between the scoreboard mm -hmm. definition of winning versus the mastery definition of winning yeah. real quick. And then what I'll do is I'll have two volunteers, one from each side of the room, and I'll yep. have them come up and here's the scenario. I'm going to set the scene for you. Your team is down, whatever sport you're in, your team is down at the half to a team that you should be beating a team that you're equally matched with and you're okay. losing on the scoreboard. You've yes. got a 30 second halftime speech to be able to give your team to motivate them to go out in the second half and play harder. I want you, you know, Aaron, yep. you're going to be the scoreboard focused coach. Uh, and I want to hear what your scoreboard focused coach halftime speech would be. And then I just say, go. And you give your speech to either the front row or you can give it to the whole section. You're talking to like this section over here on this side of the room. Yeah. And, and that, so then we'll listen and, and then we'll say, okay. And Kelly over here is going to give the same team a speech, but she's going to be focusing on mastery, effort, learning, and it's okay that they make mistakes. You've got 30 seconds. Let's hear your speech. Oh, that's awesome. It, it is so, it's such a cool activity because then to debrief it, you can just talk to the athletes quote unquote athletes in the room and mm -hmm. say, well, how did you feel when Aaron was giving you all that scoreboard focus? And they'll say, well, you know, some of them do say I was motivated because she scared me because <laughs> I was first, you know, and then you can, you can kind of tease that out a little bit. Like does focusing on the scoreboard and winning, is that a motivator? Yeah. Fear is an absolute motivator. You know, we're fight or flight people. If somebody yells, if I yell at my kids, they're going to jump. It's just what happens. But is it a long-term motivator that's going to be sustainable? And then I talked to, you know, the other side, Kelly was giving you the speech focus on mastery. Is that going to motivate you? Do you know specifically what you need to do yeah. to go out? And that's the other thing too, that this kind of brings out when you do an activity like that, because usually the scoreboard focus coaches, the speech will be, we should have been winning. We missed those shots. I can't believe you didn't get back on defense. You know, all the things are doing wrong. Yeah. And so then I say, does that give you inf any information as to what you need to do when you go back out there? And they'll say no. But then you talk to the, the mastery definition coach and they say, 
guys, we need to work better together as a team. We need to work on our communication. I lo- and they're noticing, you know, being a noticer, they're telling them. So it's just a quick, like two or three minute activity yep. that I think makes a huge impact because they get to be in the audience and they're like, wow, I'm getting yelled at and I can tell the difference. And then I'll also say, how many of you heard yourself in any of these examples? How many of you have said anything that either one of these coaches have said? So I just, I just started doing that for this and I think it works like really that. well. Yeah. And then the other part of it too is um, about confidence, because as you said, we know kids with more confidence are going to play better. Yeah. Have, have many youth sports organizations felt like they've been giving kids confidence. What do a lot of organizations do to give kids confidence? Do you have an answer to that? Mm-hmm. What do you think we do? What do we think builds confidence a lot of the time? I don't know. Actually, I, I don't know. I'm a little bit stumped by that question. Yeah, no, I put you on the spot. No, most of the time people will say like, we give them trophies. We reward oh, them. Yeah, yeah, we give yeah, them yeah. We, they're the best or the first, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And that's, like, I like them to think about like all the things we do to give kids confidence, yeah. but we're actually rewarding the wrong thing. Yeah. Because what we're finding is if we keep rewarding the kids and giving them trophies when they haven't worked hard, they're not going to, they're not going to learn that working hard is important. So, and that's where I kind of give my little like PCA is not about yeah. the participants and ribbons and the trophies were really about you know yeah there could be a trophy given and it's for the hardest worker on your team regardless of their stats you know there give the kid a trophy for that yep. you know give the kid a, a special you know blue soccer ball to use at soccer practice if he's the yeah you know, whatever you that's so i yeah i can and i can weave some of that in with the notice it and tell that like the notice it part because i don't yeah. really have a good example of that that would be a really good one of how to um kind of an example to throw in there at that time. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Ruben and Al. Hey. We're just finishing up. Um, I'm just giving Erin some suggestions. She did great. She did awesome. I like the way you also um, brought in March Madness. I mean, anything okay. you do that is in the moment, I'm actually, you know, doing a workshop tonight and I'm like, okay, I'm throwing that in because that's great. Yeah. I mean, it's perfect because <laughs> your team can, you know, they can work as hard as they can work and they're not going to win. <laughs> and yeah. sometimes they will win. You know, you never know. So I thought that was a great example. Um, Again, I also liked when you talked about the, um, the, you know, the idea of control, you had examples, you talked about the student that came in and the control. I thought that was a great story to talk about because, you know, that I loved it when you said, you know, when you were telling me that, I'm like, gosh, I don't know if that would have fired me up. But if you think about it, it wouldn't wouldn't me neither. (laughs) It's a way I love that. She told me I wasn't working hard. I can do that. I can, I can control that. So I thought that was really great. Pictures of short-term memory loss. I thought that was a great example too. It just it just really shows your sense of humor, Erin, and I, I think that's great. Um, so I'm you know I'm excited, Ruben. She's up for doing her final with you on Sunday, so that will be something that you can pick whatever principal you want. I don't know, Ruben, how many chances she's going to have to um, to facilitate on Sunday. You're going to have at least one 20-minute block, but quite honestly, Erin, uh, you're it's likely that if you want to do more you'll be able to um maybe maybe as much as an hour of practicing again if you want to um <laughs> you, you know okay. and, uh, but 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 no at at the very least let, let's let's do your your 20 minute quote unquote final great yeah that's great all right and then Ruben, i'll just let me know how it goes and uh i you know i'm, I'm confident in you i think you're doing a you're doing a great job i'm really excited about it. thanks and, i really uh, appreciate yeah, so I'm excited to see you in front of a lot of people. Okay. <laughs> Which is great. All right. Um, yeah, did you have any questions for me? I don't know. I don't think so. I thought that was, again, really, it's always helpful to practice. I think had we had more people, um, the timing, I think, would have been a little better, or you can elaborate. When it's just one-on-one, it's, you know, harder to come up with more examples after the scenario to right. chat about. But I think it was better that I was short than too long without having as much discussion, so. Yeah, I agree. Always err on the side of shorter and nobody will ever complain. No, <laughs> no, perfect. Okay, now someone next, should I hang out Let for a little bit? If, uh, um, I will let him a quick message and see if he's joining us. While we wait, Aaron. Um, oh wait, he's having trouble. He's having trouble getting his network set up. Okay. Sorry for the delay. Okay, he's on his way. So Ruben, Aaron, wait. Yeah, while, while we wait, it's looking like we're going to be able to do our the training part of our day, the, the noon to three at the same park. There's a tennis facility there, okay. evidently. Yep. And they have a conference room that they're going to make available to us. And uh, and so we from there, the transition over to the live workshop. It's close. Be, yeah, close. 
So I was going to say, if yeah. that doesn't work out, I could reach out. The UW is really close, and I know the director of the rec sports, and I'm sure they have room on a Sunday. Yeah. So well, thank you, thank you, Aaron, very much. I I think that this is going to work, and the convenience of being right there. Okay. Yeah. We should, um, For sure. We're going to pay a we're going to pay a small rental fee, but I think it's worth okay. it to have the convenience. So yeah. it's a nice place. Yeah. And so when I when I when I when that's confirmed, I'll I'll send that location out to everybody with the okay. address and stuff. Perfect. Uh, I, I'm I'm hoping that there's free parking available there, there Sunday. Is. All the time, it's free right there. Do you do you know the, the 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 park well enough to know if we could actually walk over to the the workshop venue from you there? Could. Oh, that's that's great. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Easy. And there's places to eat not too far, so it's if you know you want to grab. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Or, or a cup of coffee in between yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Actually, the tennis facility has a cute little cafe. Perfect. So, yep. That sounds ideal. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, Al, we're doing our uh, Seattle Trainer Day this Sunday, and the, the, the structure is going to be noon to three is going to be, you know, trainers in action. Um, and then from 4 to 5.30, there's a double goal coach one workshop that I'm going to co-facilitate with one of the newer trainers. And so uh, we'll, you know, uh, we'll do some modeling there and get feedback uh, there too. So that's that's what we're talking about, Al. That's great. Sounds like a, like a really good day and get to practice and then do it live. Yeah, I think, I think, I think it will be. Hi, Al. Where are you from and who are you? <laughs> yeah. So, sorry, Aaron. Um, I'm a uh, Kelly loops this together because we're from the Northwest. I'm in Portland. Oh, great. Yeah. 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 And so I work as a trainer mentor down in Portland. Uh, and a couple other things. Uh, I've been with PCA for about a year and a half, a little over a year and a half, I guess. Awesome. Well, that is, that's really fun. I, uh, my background, I worked at Seattle U in the athletics department for 10 years, and now I'm staying home with my kids. So this is a good way to stay involved. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Oh, and that's I'm coaching T-ball. I, I have just signed up. I'm coaching T-ball. There was no coach on Mary's team. Oh my so. <laughs> I gotta come up with a. I have to come up with a better nickname because we're Ballard Pediatrics, and that's just hard to say. So <laughs> we're thinking of medically uh, medical names. So my, my best suggestion so far is the Fever, but yeah. if you have any ideas, you let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I like the Fever. Yeah. I like <laughs> There's Lemetrius. How are you? Hey, how's it, how's it going? Good morning. It's good. So hey, Lemetrius. All right, how's it going? and Lemetrius called and said you never sent me the link so uh, apparently I sent everybody else the link and not him so that was my fault on that I'm sorry no worries so Lemetrius we have uh, Aaron just went Aaron is from Seattle so she just did her demo and then we have Al from Portland and you've met Ruben I assume I don't know if you've met Al too but yeah yeah I've met both I've met both my friends yeah all right hey Lemetrius all right bye Al good luck I'm only on so, for about 15 minutes and I'll have to um, leave but I want to stay on for a little bit okay Thanks, Aaron. Great. So um, you're the intro to the workshop, Lemetrius? Yep, I'm ready. Okay, so do you wanna, can you see the PowerPoint that I have up? Yes, I see the PowerPoint. Okay, if you wanna make it bigger, if you need it bigger, you can just click on the little square that has the PowerPoint in it, and it'll make that big on the screen, if that's helpful. Okay. But I can just follow along with you as you go. You can just start with, you know, your little intro and, you know, the text to sign in, and then go from there. All right. Thank you for the intro, Kelly. Uh, yeah, welcome. <laughs> good afternoon, good morning, good evening to those. My name is Lemetrius Davis. I am a Portland, Oregon native. Um, I played sports throughout high school and college and professional as well. Uh, currently, I am coaching youth sports uh, from the ages of probably third grade to about senior post post high school um and i'm involved in pca uh based off of what is called positive coaching alliance um, i'm all about the positivity uh i'm a coach and i wanted to be a part of i wanted to be a part of a group alliance as such who uh, model the behavior that I wanted to model myself and model the behavior that I wanted my athletes to follow as well. Uh, and PCA 
uh, fit right into the criteria, and I'm excited to to, to join PCA. Uh, enough about me. Um, mm -hmm. Can everybody please pull out their phones? Um, so this is a uh, text generation. We all know this. Uh, we have tons of kids who use their phone every day. Uh, so can we please pull out our phones? And before we put them on silent, can we send a text message to this number? 650-763-2405. Um, a pound and then the number. Uh, please include your first name, your last name, and your confirmation email. All this does is let us know that you're here, you're present. Um, so any any requirements that you have within your league can all be settled right here by signing mm -hmm. in. Uh, okay, can we go to the next slide, please? Yep. Do I need to be the person like saying like go to the next slide every time, or are you? Just you can just keep going. I'll try to follow along. If I uh, if I forget, just tell me to click, and I will. All right. So, uh, so we have. Welcome everybody to Positive Coaching Alliance Workshop. Um, our first topic we're going to speak about is the book that we all received upon coming in, The Power of Double Goal Coaching. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to talk about this for a little bit, and then we're going to get into the, into the workshop and all the good stuff. So the PCA is all about developing winners in sports and in life. And with this book, becoming a power, a, a, a double goal coach, what you do is not only are you considerate of the scoreboard, but you're also considerate of the athlete and their human being needs, such as you know listening, such as being a, a person to mentor them, whether it be on the court, on the field, whatever the sport environment in, but also outside of that as well. And we're not just a scoreboard coach, we're also results oriented and also based off of like life, you know, like becoming better civilians. Um, next, we want to know, everyone wants to know who is PCA, Positive Coach Alliance. What are their, what's their objective and motive? Um, has anybody here um, familiar with PCA by a show of hands? Okay, One okay, person. okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So PCA, as I said before, Positive Coaching Alliance. This is a nonprofit group that started in 1998 at Stanford. Uh, so what it, as I said earlier, what it's about is having a cohesive group between the athletes, the parents, and the coaching, and also the community. Making sure we're all on the same on the same wavelength, making sure we're all uh, giving our best that we can for the athlete, and then also we're modeling our own behavior for the athlete as well. Uh, there's been a thousand plus positive coaching and development zone workshops. Um, development zone. Just just want to stay there for a second. So development zone. Everyone knows what the word development means. Development zone. So that's the time frame that we have with the youth. Uh, they have this time frame of knowing or not knowing if they want to be a part of a team cohesive group or a sports group. And us as coaches, that's when we come in because we have the we have the the savvy to be able to persuade them in a in a, a positive way. So we want to give them positive experiences so they come back to the sport or give them a positive experience. So they know how to uh, be within a group and be positive as well. Um, can I have a show of hands? Uh, what does positive coaching look like to you? Um, I would so say positive coaching is just excited to be there and having fun. The coach is actually enjoying themselves. Exactly. Anybody else? Um, everybody is encouraged. Maybe everybody um, gets a ribbon at the end or a trophy. Exactly. Anybody else have any feedback? 
I would say where the coach is uh, a good role model for the athletes. Exactly. Al, you have anything to, to chime in? Yeah, I think, um, well, since it's positive, I'm, I'm guessing that it's uh, kind of not too competitive, you know, like it's just being nice to the kids and making sure they have a good time. Okay. Uh, everyone had great feedback, you know, personal perspectives, always welcome. Uh, specifically towards Al, I'll get to your, your statement a little later in the workshop. Uh, so to you know, but to everybody else, including your out yourself, everyone's right aligned to what it looks like. Um, so personally, to me myself, I feel like positive energy, positive coaching presents a different outcome for the youth, for the community, for the parents, and for the kids, rather than a negative one. A uh, results oriented, as far as in, uh, did you dribble with your left hand? Uh, did you make 10 free throws? You know, those are things that are like, you know, not so much positive, but more so along the lines of negativity because if the, if the person says no, then they're going to feel less than. If, if the person says no, I didn't get my 10 free throws, but everybody else did, you know, they're going to feel like they're not a part of the team. They're not going to be as connected to the team. And that's what we're not trying to get. We're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make a positive outcome for everybody. So it doesn't matter if that person made 10 free throws or if the other person shot 10 free throws. It's the point of they they did the job. Their task was to go and shoot 10 free throws. I didn't say go make 10 free throws, just to shoot them. You know, we get better with time. Uh, the power of positivity. The perception that we have, the perception that the world has, is the best way to get the best out of others is with negativity and threats. Typically, that's what we all have been aligned to. Uh, not so much the word negativity, but more so pressured, pressured and threats. You know, put pressure on the athletes. Uh, tell the athletes, hey, if you don't make, if you don't make ten free throws, or if you don't make ten passes, then we all gonna go to the line. We have a line drill. No, that's th that's threatening the athlete. Uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't allow their their performance to be at the top because they're so worried about what happens if I mess up. So it's not it's not giving us the outcome that we want in a positive outlook. Uh, does anybody here have any uh, any any experiences with positivity, whether it be with coaching or whether it be as an athlete or as a parent, just looking from the outside looking in? Well, I've had experience with all of them. Um, positivity from parents and encouragement and feeling supported um, no matter what. Um, had coaches who believed in me, teachers, teachers who really encouraged me um, to think beyond my little world and horizons. So I've, I've had that, those kinds of experiences. Anybody else? Yeah, I've had, uh, I've had uh, oh, yeah. two. Sorry, Kelly. Uh, okay. I've had both too, and I, I know I responded much better to that um, positive person that uh, made things fun and showed me that I could uh, move forward further than I thought I could, rather than the negative coach or the, the person that was always uh, too demanding. Gotcha. Kelly? Uh, I'm going to push back a little bit, because when I was in high school, um, my my field hockey coach was really negative. She was majorly win at all costs. And, um, and my basketball coach was not. And our field hockey team went all the way to states. And our basketball team did not play well. So I think sometimes negativity is a motivator and it gets, it gets kids to perform. I agree. Um, so just tying all that back in. I feel like positive emotions are contagious. The the energy that you put into being positive is very contagious. And it's, it's a little bit extra work as well. Like it's easy to be a negative person. It's easy to say, oh, you're not doing good today. It's easy to say, oh, you didn't make that pass. It's easy to say, oh, why didn't you make, oh, it's easy to say you missed the shot. It's easy to say you didn't run it back. Like it's, it's easy to say that. But it's harder to be 
a positive effect on a person. And as I said, it's very contagious. When you have one person who's going above and beyond to, to, to give the remarks and feedback on positivity, then all that does is it, it has a lingering effect on your, on your, on your teammates. So now your teammates, oh, they, they look at you and they say, oh, well, man, they're so positive. Doesn't matter what I do. Doesn't matter if I make a shot. Doesn't matter if I hustle down and I don't get the basketball. They're always telling me good job. They're always telling me keep my head up. That's that's contagious. So now what that does is it gives that person the ability to respond in a positive way to the next person, and then so on and so on. And that all comes from the coach. Typically, it should come from the coach because the coach should be modeling the behavior. And as I said, it has a a positive impact has a way bigger impact on your team than a negative. Well, how, how, let, let me let me let me rephrase that. A positive impact has a way better impact on your team than a negative impact. A negative impact can go just as far as a positive impact. So we gotta we gotta remember that the negativity to trickle down just as fast as the positivity trickles down. But we have to make sure that we're modeling the positivity behavior so our athletes are modeling our behavior, which is positivity. Um, next, we have a, uh, um, a group of elite coaches that we have here at PCA. And those group of elite coaches, they're familiar faces for some. Um, more than likely, all the volunteer coaches, they're all... all Excuse me. All the coaches are volunteer coaches on the PCA National Advisory Board, and what they do is they look to impact their game. They look to impact the game, and more than just a scoreboard, they look to impact the game and lifelong lessons. So what they like to do is they like to model their behavior, and they like to give it out to others, of course. And what that does is. It creates, as I said, that positive trickle down effect to the rest of the team. Or, you know, if I'm a if I'm a head coach and I have the PCA method, what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach that to my coaches. So the same way as a head coach, it trickles down to your team. It can also trickle down to your staff. So as a head coach, you can also trickle down to your staff five five adults. So now you have a total of six adults who are now have all have that PCA model behavior and they're giving it to the athletes. And that right there alone will change, will move mountains, change communities, change parents' uh, perspectives on sports, whether it be negative or if, if it was positive, even more positivity. All those coaches are familiar faces. As I said before, those coaches have their own set of experiences. But one thing that they all have in common is they all believe in the PCA method. That's one thing that, that, that we can all take away from that. Because all these coaches believe in the PCA method and they all believe in showcasing and expressing that to their athletes and their coaches as well. If I'm not mistaken, a lot of those, a lot of those coaches, they do a lot of individual workshops as well too by themselves. And I'm pretty sure if, if you ever was, you know, chiming in, that you'll hear some of the same lingo that you'll hear at a PCA workshop. Hmm. Uh, all right. So let's go back to the negativity. Unfortunately. Negativity research compiled shows that the positive, uh, excuse me, negativity research compiled shows that once you are negative with an athlete, the athlete then starts to second guess their self, second guess their talents, second guess who they are as a person. They're not as accustomed to hearing positive words, so they don't know how to act when they are given positivity. Um, let me see. Can I, can, all right, so can we... I'll give my experience first. I'll give my experience first. The one time that I had negativity distract me from my my task at hand was in college. Uh, I was in college and I had a 
a family member of mine had passed away and she was very extremely important to me but at the time uh i had went to my coach obviously because i'm an athlete you know you go to your coach if you don't go to your friends you go to your coaches because they're adults i went to my i went to my coach and and i told him about my situation and told him about how i felt and how i just i was feeling my emotional tank wasn't being filled at the end of the day my emotional tank was very low which had caused me to to feel and to behave the way that I did. So I went to my coach and I asked for advice. And my coach, the advice that I got back from him was, hey, we all lose people in life, get over it, we gotta play football. At the time that he said that to me, it was like, really? Like, no empathy? Uh, it changed my whole behavior towards him. It changed my whole outlook and my outcomes on the whole organization as far as in my college. Uh, Looking back on it now, you know, I can say, like, maybe he was right. But at the end of the day, you know, if a positive remark would have been given to me, who knows what it would have, would have happened for me. Now, at this time, can we all close our eyes and have one negative task that we may have felt like, you know, changed our outcome as far as in us as a coach or us as a player or us as a parent? Just one outcome. Sure, when you're ready. Let me, Tris, I'll, I'll share. Um, I, Kelly's heard the story, I think, before. Uh, summer between fourth and fifth grade, I had surgery on my feet, corrective surgery. And so I was re still recuperating when the, the, the new school year started. And first day of school, uh, you know, the teacher at one point sent us outside to, to run around the field, you know, get some exercise, run a lap. And uh, I was uh, way behind the rest of the group. And when I got to the door, uh, she said, wow, if you can't run a lap, you'll never make it to sixth grade. And I remember, uh, I mean, I still remember it to this day. So it had a, a it, it, it was hurtful and uh, <laughs> it definitely had an impact. Yeah, I, that definitely would have an impact for me as well too if I heard that as a, as a young kid. <laughs> Kelly? I just, the one that I think of, and again, Ruben's heard this too, but I got to play in a, a varsity basketball game my freshman year in high school, and that was a big deal. I got pulled up to play on varsity, and um, I had an open shot to the net. You know, it was like a Hail Mary pass down the court. I got down and um, went to do this left-handed layup and completely missed. It went right over the top of the net and back over the other side. Didn't even touch the rim. And the coach instantly called me and subbed me out right away. And um, I didn't get another varsity game till sophomore year. And that was like the beginning of my freshman year. And it was one mistake that I made. And he made it clear to me that that was an easy shot. It was a left-handed layup. There was nobody on me. There's no reason I could have missed that shot. And uh, yeah, and I will never forget just his face. Like he pointed right there at the court and he said, come out, you're out. And it was literally like two seconds after I took the shot. I didn't even get a chance to get back on defense. And I was out. So that was something that really impacted me and it, it i mean again as you said like i had a totally different view of that coach for the next few years yeah. how about you al i think uh one that i think of is uh high school tennis i was playing on the tennis team as a freshman i was pretty small and uh the coach didn't like the way i played tennis um we had a tennis ladder to see who was going to make the team we had challenge day, and on challenge day, I beat two guys, and I thought, great, I'm in. I'm, I'm going to be on the travel team. And he took me aside and said, yeah, you know, yeah, I know you beat them, but um, you know, I'm not going to travel you because they, they're better than you. Mm. <laughs> Just went, wow. So that's, that's pretty yeah. negative, yeah. yeah. Very blunt as well, too. Yeah. Um, okay, so... With all that being said, with all our experiences being um, broadcast, do you agree or disagree with the negative and positive standpoint? I think positive works better. I agree. I agree. Okay, so I, I, I like the fact that we all agree, but can we give ex, uh, examples of why we agree on one, on one side rather than the other? 
Well, I, I found that. I think um, it works better. Oh, sorry, Al. That's okay. Uh, I found that negativity will work in the moment, but it's not long lasting. Um, you can you can scream at somebody and, and get their compliance, but um, it it doesn't stick with you. Positivity usually works better for the long term. Exactly. I was just gonna say personally for me, when people are negative with me, I, it gets in my head, and I have trouble shaking it. And so that's going to definitely mess up my performance. When somebody's positive and encouraging, even if I mess up, I'll play harder for them. I agree. I totally agree. Uh, I'm the same way. I feel like when you know positivity is given, it doesn't matter if it's you know me making a shot or me hustling back on defense or you know me committing a foul if I'm playing basketball. As long as you know, you know, there's always effort in everything. So you know, if if you can point out the effort, that's that goes a long way for for an uh, athlete, and and even for like just human beings, it's like we when we hear more positivity rather than negative, we perform better, we react better, we have a better vibe, we have better energy. Um, so PCA's vision. Um, we learn from our experiences. So um, PCA's vision was a collective cohesive group coming with all their experiences and putting it in a positive coaching alliance format where it only deals with the positivity amongst the coaches. Uh, typically, uh, we can compare and we can contrast and reflect on, on our experiences as far as in if we're doing the right thing or if we're not doing the right thing, or if we feel indifferent about a situation or we didn't know how to handle it, or you know, we handle it the, the correct way. Uh, so us as a group, PCA, you know, we're on the courts, we're on the football fields, the soccer fields, we're on the sidelines of the games, uh, and we're also involved in the in the parents' livelihood to make them better understanding of what we provide as an organization. Pretty much what we're trying to do is we're trying to give ways for our youth to flourish within their respective sports. And also and also we can't ever forget this. We have we're trying to make them become better people. Like that's the overall focus point of PCA. Not only are we competitive still, and not only do we continue to help the athlete become a better athlete, but what we're doing is we're helping the athlete become a better civilian. As as Kelly said, the positivity goes a longer way. Sports are not forever. We all know this. We cannot play the sport forever, I should say. We can always be involved in the sport, which is why we need great mentors like ourselves, like like everyone in the audience, to to cling on to this method of PCA because we're all about giving positivity and realigning our thinking for the youth and for our parents. Uh, so we have a resource center. And our resource center we give weekly tips. Uh, the book that you have when you first came in, the power of double the double goal coaching book. That's a, a great book to have to look into to go back before practice, after practice, on your on your downtime, just to get uh, acclimated with what's going on with the PCA uh, methods. And as I said, the resource the re resource center that we have it's updated. Weekly, daily, things are going in and out all the time. This is not some ancient type of coaching. We're 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 moving with the generation. We're being very innovating, and we're continuing to find new ways to impact our youth, impact the parents, and impact our communities. Um, Demetrius, I'm actually going to stop you there. Go um, ahead, please. Yeah, no, that's okay. I'm going to stop you because usually we give about 20 minutes for these demos, and that was a little bit over 20. 
But I just, I mean, it's in, a, in your own workshop, you can go a little bit over, but for the demonstration purposes, I like for you to be able to see how far you got in the intro at 20 minutes. So, that was 20 um, minutes? You know, you, what's that? That was 20? It was actually like 23. Yeah. Oh my gosh, okay. I was like, on. I was <laughs> only goes, on slide 11. I, I was only on, like I had like one, two, three, four. I think I had six more slides left. Yeah, you had this one, two, three, four, yeah, about six, about six. But, you know, I don't want you to think of it necessarily in terms of how many slides, though, like numbers of slides, because we don't say that every single trainer has to get through every slide. These slides, these slides are here to help and support you and keep it structured. But what's more important is the concepts that you're bringing to these coaches. So I don't want you to feel like, you know, you have to click on every single slide and hit every single point on the slide. Um, if it were up to me, there wouldn't be slides at workshops, but I'm not the boss. So there, there is, but it's more of the, the concepts and the ideas that you're sharing with these coaches and having them think about them is what's most important. So I would say for what you just did there, the, um, the part about when you stop right here, like what makes a great youth experience for kids. This is a concept that can get the coaches in the room to think about what was good for them. What did they remember about youth sports and are they doing that? It's kind of where they, they can figure out why they had such a good youth sports experience and then figure out, am I doing it? So this is the last concept that I would say you'd have to get into is um, really what it means to be a double goal coach. And that these yeah. experiences, not just in positivity, but the experiences that we're bringing with all the principles, the honoring the game, mastery, and all that. And then the Herm Edwards video is the last part just to get them to think about long term. When they're, as you said, sports, will, sports won't go on forever. And long term, what legacy do they want to leave behind? So I would say you had like two more little concepts that I wanted to make sure that you got through. Um, but you know what? That's for a first run through, though. I liked a lot of the things you did, and um, and I want to I want to support you in that. And I also wanted to tell you uh, I don't know if you can see the comments that Ruben left. He had to get off. We have a call. He had a call at two. But um, Ruben's comments were he said I have a meeting to join. Sorry about that. But he said. That let me create you had a strong intro with the why, why you're a PCA trainer, good reference to the book. Um, he said, in response to Al, you highlighted that positive coaching is about performance and winning, which was good. Um, then he said, my comment that I said about negative coaching that works, he said, you know, sometimes it's good to ask the rest of the coaches what they think. So when I pushed back and said, you know, my field hockey coach is really negative, my basketball coach is really positive, um, and we did better with the negative coach, and you were like, yeah, okay, that works. Um, that's one of those, I did that on purpose just to see how you can answer that. And that would be yeah, one of those places where he's like, I thought, you did, well, I thought that you <laughs> did do it on purpose, but at the same time, I was like, man, like, should I, like, I was like, I, I wanted to ask more questions about that, but then I was thinking about the time also. Yeah. Well, you know, you're going to get somebody almost every workshop I've done. There's always somebody in the crowd that's going to push back and say, you know what? I yell and scream and it works. That's how I get my athletes to respect me. That's how I get my, my, you know, my boys football team. I can't be positive with them. I got to be screaming at them. There's always going to be somebody. So you just have to be ready to answer a question like that. How, if you did have time or if you weren't worried about time, how would you have answered that? How would you have responded to that? If I said, you know, my, my most negative coach, we had the best record. Well, I would ask, you know, well, what was the relationship like outside of the sport? Not good. Exactly. So like, I would have just kind of like tied in because I wanted to tie in the whole connective piece as well, like being connected as far as, you know, the positivity. What it does is it connects the, the coach and it connects the coaches to the players and it connects mm -hmm. all the players together. So what I would have done was I was just being more so aligned with talking about how, you know, did it give you any results outside of the sport? Like outside of the scoreboard, did you have any results? Yeah. That's good. Yeah, because I use, I use the same coaching story in my workshops when I talk about 20 years later when she retired and I couldn't get anybody to come to her retirement dinner. That was where it was a big hit for me. She was the most successful coach in our high school, scoreboard-wise, and we couldn't get enough people to, to fill seats at her retirement dinner. Kind of oh, a, kind of a, um, so then Ruben said, too, um, good personal negativity story. He thought that was a good story about your coach that, you know, after you had that death of a, of a, of a friend and, um, you know, that was a great story. I, I like that too. I thought that was a really good example. Um, and he said, good drawing out of our examples of negativity that we've experienced. So those were Ruben's comments. Um, Alex, I'd love to hear 
some of the things that you really liked about what Lemitrius did, and then maybe if you have a suggestion for him moving forward, what would you sure. think? Well, I, I always like stories, so I like I liked your story a lot about your coach, and you know it was very personal, and I think those things um, really play well in a workshop environment. And I'd encourage you to think of more stories that you could use to tell, you know, our principles and what we need to get through to the coaches and post the slides. And that's going to come with practice, Demetrius. This is I remember my first practice, and I was a mess. You know, I, there's just so much to do and so little time that uh, it's hard to do. So I'm glad you got through this one. Um, you always got to start someplace. So, um, you know, I think the stories and your personality are what's going to sell the coaches um, as you're weaving those in. That just takes some time and practice. Um, I think that... Um, um, I think it's just practice. Uh, one thing I think as a presenter that I would point out is that uh, when you are thinking about uh, your next step and you're not really too sure, your eyes go straight up in the air and you, you kind of look like this. <laughs> and, uh, that's that's going to go away when you get mastery over the, over the information. You know, I'm not, I'm not concerned about that at all. What, what I think Kelly and I want is your personality to show up. Uh, okay. and that's going to carry the day. Um, and you can do that while still getting across our, our points that we need to make uh, from the PCA standpoint. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, thanks, Al. Thanks. I, Lemetrius, I agree. I saw a lot of really good things. And I think, you know, being this is your first time, and this is kind of weird doing it over a video. I get that. I know you do different with coaches in a room. But, but one of the things that we like to do at the beginning of these demos is just to make sure that you have the concepts down, that you have the language down. And I saw a lot of good, I liked a lot of the ways that you phrase things. Um, and I thought you were really conversational. There's some people that just get into like teacher mode and they're just like spouting out information. And I felt like you really, you really did connect with me if I was a coach in the room and made it conversational. The more, as Al said, the more comfortable you are with the material, the more that you can get away from the slides and just kind of talk about these concepts and ask us more questions. Um, you know, ask us, what are the challenges? And, and you did ask us a lot of questions. I actually put down one time, I thought you asked too much. Um, I usually tell the trainers, like, hey, ask a lot of questions, get the coaches involved. But sometimes I think if you get one pretty good answer, you don't have to get an answer from everybody. You know, you just move on from there because the intro is really supposed to be that. It's like the trailer to the movie. It's supposed to be short, quick, just to get everybody like, okay, this is what we're going to be talking about today. And then when you get into each of the principles, that's when you can really dive into the tools. But the intro is just kind of, it, sh it should go pretty quickly. So... I think, you know, that the time that you spent on the negativity and the positivity part, it doesn't really have to be sold. This workshop's going to sell itself when you get into the tools the coaches will use. So just to keep that keep that pace moving a little quicker, I think would be helpful. Um, I really like some of the things you brought up about getting everybody on the same wavelength. I thought that was a really good point to bring up. Um, you know, you were talking about the, the pressure and the threats. You know, pressure and threats is, is something that a lot of coaches use to motivate and, you know, that's where I'd like to hear a story from your personal experience because you've played at such a high level. I'm sure you've had coaches that have used pressure and threats to get you to motivate on the field. You know, maybe throw in a little story there about, you know, a coach that you had and this is what he did and he thought it was helping, but really this is what it made me feel like. You know, something like that in the beginning is, is helpful to connect you to the material. So that would be one question. Um, I like how you said it's hard to be positive. It's really hard to be positive. I think that was a really strong point that you made. And that positivity is contagious um, to your players. You were talking a lot about coaches modeling their behavior to players. So I, I picked up on that. I thought that was good. And you talked about how this positive model trickles down. And I thought that was good, too. Um, a couple times, I don't know if, Al, you picked up on this. You said a few times, like, the PCA method. And you said it, like, three or four times. And it's not, it's not wrong to say that at all. We don't use that term a lot in PCA. We usually say, like, the positive coaching model or the double goal coach model. Uh, I don't know why we don't call it a method, but I just picked up on that. And I was like, you know, the PCA method is really like when I think of a method, I think of like, here are the steps to be a positive coach, which so it is a method. But we usually talk about the person being a double goal coach. And uh -huh. here are some tools that we can use. Just a little language, picky language thing. Um, Al, I don't know if you noticed that or if that if that was a something that you uh, would point out or not. But that was just something I... I just probably wouldn't use the word method, more of like, this is the model of coaching that we want you to do. Um, 
Yeah, let me see. Oh, the college story. Yeah, I thought that was great. The college story that you said. Uh, not a great story, but impactful. You know, that's something I'd remember. Um, the, the part two, you brought up a couple times that, you know, we're in the business of making better people, better civilians. And I think that's really a strong point. You can tell that that's, that's what you're passionate about. And that's why you're here. And that resonated with me. I thought that was great. Um, the idea that sports aren't forever. I mean, that's something that these coaches have to realize. And they're, sometimes these coaches are coaching like this is the most important thing in their life. And they're coaching like 14-year-olds. You know, like, come on. So I think that was good. You sort of gave a good perspective on that. Um, and let me see. But, I mean, those, those are a lot of the things that I, that I picked up on that I really like. In terms of improvement, just being more comfortable with the material so you can just keep it moving. And um, just, you know, when you ask a question, get a couple answers and move on to the next one. Or have us turn to a partner and share something. You know, share an experience you have with a negative coach. And then we share with a partner. And then you don't necessarily have to share it out loud. You can just say, okay, now you understand what I mean. How'd that make you feel just talking about that negative coach? You know, something like that. Keep the pace moving without you having to call on different people individually. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, cool. Well, this is, I actually recorded this. And um, I think actually um, Aaron that went before you, she goes really fast. So I think between the two of you, there's a good balance. If you want to watch, she went through the Elm Street Mastery in about 15 minutes. So I think she went a little over the overboard with the speed, and you went a little under with the speed. So I think uh, to watch them both would be, you know, a good a good balance for you two to learn from each other. Yeah, I gotta. Uh, I feel like I need to. Well, I feel like I need to be more effective with my communication. So I'm like, so I'm not repeating myself. A lot, but the things that I do repeat are like things that you know PCA has as a, a objective or a mission, or you know, like yeah. it's, it's like it's something where like I'm not repeating something of my own personal experience, but I'm repeating something of the PCA uh, model or formula. And yeah. then uh, I feel like I did catch myself a couple of times looking up in the air <laughs> and uh, uh so i i definitely caught that and i feel like i just want to be like you said just be more be more uh comfortable with the material so i don't i, I have like less words of like um or uh i guess you know just words that don't need to be there yeah uh i actually i didn't know that i didn't know i took 23 minutes so that's a good thing <laughs> I was, yeah. <laughs> the whole time I was sitting here thinking, like, man, like, I'm going to get through this so fast. And then, like, I start talking. I'm like, whoa, I have seven more slides. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it helps, too, when you when you start looking at the rest of the workshop to actually, you know, be a trainer and do it. Just think about, like, what are the keys? What are the, what are the couple, maybe two takeaways from each principle? And, you know, for the intro, my takeaway, as you said, repeat, is we're here to develop better athletes, more importantly, better people. So that's something that you brought up a couple times. That's something that I say in a lot of my workshops. I'll have that theme going through, you know, a lot of the workshops. Is that decision you make as a coach going to help that kid be a better person? I mean, it's a really simple concept. Yes, it'll help them be a better athlete, but is it going to help them in the long run be a better person? And I'll use that for each time. I'll come back to that for mastery. I'll come back to that for honoring the game. So I want to hit that part in the intro. The idea of we are, we are in the business of developing better people. Where else are these kids going to get this? They're not going to get it in math class. They're sure not going to get it, you know, they're not going to get this in every area of their life. And a lot of their parents aren't spending the time with them that they can. We are the ones that they're listening to. And yeah. sports, man, being out on the field is where they're going to get hit with these tough, tough situations. And they got to decide, are they going to bounce back or are they going to give up? They're going to be faced with failure all over the place. Are we going to help them become better because of that failure? Or are we going to help them run away? and be more scared. You know, these are the kind of the concepts that I like to bring up in the intro just to get the coaches thinking and inspire them like, yeah, I want to do this. How do I do it? Now, the rest of the workshop, I'm going to tell you how you do it. Well, I appreciate the, uh, the feedback a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'll, send you, I'll send you the recording of this so that you uh, not you don't you might not want to watch it back, but if you want to, go ahead. Some people are like, no, I don't want to watch it. But yeah. uh, you know, there's a lot of different. I know throughout the course there were a lot of different demonstrations. You got it. You there's links all over the, the course um, that you can watch of all different styles, all different types of people. So you can, you know, I usually pick up little things from each one of them. But thank you very much. I can tell that you, uh, you were you were preparing for this well, and I'm looking forward to seeing you do it the next time. 
Yes, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it as well. All right, so you can pick another principal. Um, pick one of the principles that you want to do. You can do E-Tank or you can you know jump around if you want to. It's up to you. But let me know when you're ready to do uh, the next principle. Okay, I will definitely let you know this week. Okay, thanks, Demetrius. Thanks, Thank Al, you. for joining us. Thank yeah. you, Al. Thanks, Kelly. Bye-bye. All right, talk to you later.